My name is Glenn Hawkins. I am the preacher for the Church of Christ in Maslin, Ohio, and we welcome you to this program, Light from Above. One of the stories in the Old Testament that most of us are familiar with has to do with the time that God spoke to Abraham and told him to take his only son Isaac and offer him up as a sacrifice to himself. This is found in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis, where Abraham responds to the call of God, takes his son Isaac, along with two other of his servants, and they start their journey to the place where God had told him to go. When they get near the place, Abraham tells the two young men to wait while he and his son go for the sacrifice. And he said, when we're finished, we will come back and see you. Now Abraham was told he needed to offer his son Isaac as the sacrifice. The question is, how did, I, how did Abraham know that he would return with Isaac? Let me read something to you from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 19. He, that is Abraham, considered that God is able to raise men from the dead, from which he also received him, Isaac, back as a type. That's how strong his faith was. As the two men were going to a place called Mount Moriah, Isaac looked at his father and said, My father, here is the wood for the burnt offering. Here's the fire. But where is the offering? Where's the lamb? And Abraham looked at him and said, Son, God will provide the burnt offering. Well, we know that that's exactly what happened. God did provide the sacrifice. The hand of Abraham was stayed. And as he looked around, he saw a ram caught in a thicket. And that ram was sacrificed in place of Isaac. And so Abraham named the place Jehovah-Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. This question, where is the lamb, is at the heart of the message of what the Bible is all about. Of course, in the immediate context, it's Isaac's sincere desire to worship God as he wanted to worship Him. And yet in the total context of the Bible's teaching, this question serves to remind us of what God has done in providing Jesus. When Jesus made His appearance on earth, He came toward the Jordan River where John the Baptist was baptizing. And John saw Him. And in John 1 and verse 29, He said, Behold the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. I want us to consider that question for a few moments. Where is the Lamb? Let me suggest to you in the first place that He is in eternity identified. In 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, the Apostle Peter wrote of Jesus that we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish blemish and without spot, he was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world. The lamb, Jesus, had identity even before the world was. In the silent councils of eternity past, the infinite mind of God before the foundation of this world planned a plan and purposed a purpose. And Paul in Ephesians 3 and verse 11 calls it the eternal purpose of God. There are a couple of places in the book of Acts where this concept is found as well. For example, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 27 and 28, uh, Peter says, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. 
Earlier in Acts 2, and verse 23, in the great sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. It was determined before this world was ever formed that Jesus would be the Lamb of God. So before there was ever a Lamb, He was the Lamb at heaven's high council table. Before there was ever sin and sacrifice for it, He was slain in purpose as the perfect sacrifice. Before there was ever a world, He was purposed to be the divine satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. So He is in eternity identified. In the second place, He is in the Scriptures prophesied. One of the great Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament is Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah is called the Messianic prophet. It was from Isaiah chapter 53, eight centuries later, that an Ethiopian eunuch, a treasurer of the Queen Candace of the Ethiopians, was reading on his way from Jerusalem back home where he had been to worship. A preacher by the name of Philip was instructed to go near him, and he heard him reading from Isaiah chapter 53. The place that he was reading said, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And Philip said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I except someone guide me? He said, Of whom speaketh the prophet, of himself or of somebody else? And Philip, taking that exact passage, preached unto him Jesus. That's only one of approximately 300 scriptures that deal with the Lamb of God, with Jesus. In John 5 and verse 39, Jesus told a group of Jewish leaders, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of Me. After His resurrection, He met two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they were talking about the events that had transpired. And in Luke 24 and verse 27 says that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. There were literally scores of prophecies in the Old Testament that relate to the coming of Jesus. His birth was predicted. It was predicted He would be born of a virgin. It was predicted that He would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And on and on we could go. There are just prophecies concerning Him in the Old Testament. There was no reason why uh, the, the Jewish leaders of the day did not know about Him. They had it all right there in the Scriptures. The Apostle Paul knew the Old Testament Scriptures concerning uh, Jesus. And uh, as he would go into various places, he would look for a synagogue, as he did in Acts 17. He reasoned and explained and demonstrated here in Acts 17 that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and that Jesus whom I preach to you is Christ. So secondly, Jesus is identified in Scriptures in, in prophecy. Thirdly, He is also in history verified. Jesus was an actual historical person. He was not a myth or a fable. Had opportunity about a year ago to listen to a discussion of this very topic down in Parkersburg, West Virginia. There was a man there who had a couple of doctor's degrees who was more or less an agnostic as far as Jesus was concerned, but he believed that Jesus was a myth, that is, he was an invention of man. And there were others there who refuted this idea. There are very few people today who say that he was not a real person. A few, but not very many. The evidence is just simply clear 
that Jesus actually existed. There are other accounts of Jesus other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He really was born, He really lived, and He really died. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 20, Peter says of Jesus that He was manifested in these last times for you. The word manifested means to make visible, and it refers to His appearance in the world. I want to read to you a statement from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now listen to this very carefully. John is an eyewitness of Jesus. He was one of Jesus' apostles. He lived with Him for about three and a half years, almost day and night. And listen what he writes. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, and this life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. There was no doubt in the mind of John that Jesus was a real character. To the idea of Jesus being a fable or a myth, there is another interesting statement. This comes from the writings of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter, or in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. It's almost as if Uh, Peter anticipates what some today are saying when he says this in verse 16. For we, I think he's referring to those apostles, including himself, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables or myths or tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. In other words, Peter is saying we, the apostles, saw Him. We beheld Him. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Now, either Peter told the truth or he didn't. They're in the third option here. Why would they lie? Why would they suffer death for somebody they knew wasn't real and didn't exist? Jesus was as real in history as anyone who has ever lived on earth, and yet He had much more influence than anybody else. History without Jesus would be like astronomy without stars, botany without flowers, or geology without rocks. Jesus owned no property in the world, yet He's embedded in the world's history, the world's art, the world's music, the world's literature, and the world's government and political arenas. We count time by Him, or at least we used to, by the terms B.C. and A.D., Architects point to the Lamb in history with their buildings that honor Him. Artists point to the Lamb of God in history with the pictures that praise Him. And the poets point to the Lamb in history with their verses that extol Him. He is in history verified. Fourthly, where is the Lamb? He is in heaven glorified. John while on the island of Patmos for the Word of God, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. This is found in Revelation chapter 1. He sees a door standing open into heaven. And in Revelation chapter 4, as he looks uh, into heaven, he sees a throne, and one who sat on the throne, who was God. Then, in Revelation chapter 5, notice what happens next here. Notice what John sees. In verse 6 and 7, And I saw between the throne with four living creatures and elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. John sees a lamb, a lamb that looks like he had been slain. And of course, uh, that would refer to the death of Christ. And John hears a new song that's being sung. And what is that song? Here it is in verse 9 and 10 of Revelation 5. You, the Lamb, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and has redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations. 
and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then John continues, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels round the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We have hymns that we sing at church that are based upon this one passage. And he continues, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power to him that sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. A major focus of heaven will be God and the Lamb. In heaven we're told we will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And I like this statement in Revelation 22 and verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Where's the Lamb? Isaac asked the question. Abraham said, God will provide. And He did. God viewed the actions of Abraham as he had the knife raised as already offering his son Isaac. And so the ram was a substitute. And that's why Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh. But in the case of Jesus, God did not stay His hand but allowed Him to die on the cross. The Lamb of God that takes away your sin and my sin. Just as real as was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the host of Old Testament characters. We have learned that Jesus is the Lamb, that He is in eternity identified He is in the Scriptures prophesied. He is in history verified. And He is in heaven glorified. And that's where He is now, making intercession for you and I. But I have one final thing to put before you. Where is the Lamb in your life? Let me read something to you from the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. Paul was in a Roman prison at the time he wrote this to the Philippian church. And yet he was a very joyful man. He told the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Listen to him in verse 20 of chapter 1. Start with, chapter, uh, start with verse 19. For I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, listen carefully, that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ shall even now as always be exalted or magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Where is the Lamb? In Paul's life, he was magnified. He was exalted. And Paul said, it doesn't make any difference whether it's life or death. Again, the question, where is he in your life? Is he magnified? Is he exalted in your life? If not, why not? Several years ago, a gospel quartet group that I knew personally sang a song that really impressed me. And I think it would be a good way to bring this lesson to a close. And I would like to read the words of that song to you for your edification. It's based upon 
the incident in Genesis 22 about Abraham and his son Isaac. The words of the song are as follows. Although Abraham could not understand why God in his great love could ask him for the only son he had, yet when it seemed all hope was dim, his faith this promise sang, God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb, the only sacrifice that sin demands. Just as he proved to Abraham, he would provide himself a lamb. Behold the lamb of God, God himself the lamb. Then the promise rang. Unto Bethlehem this God reached down to man and gave to us the only son he had. Then when his time had come, with his precious blood he sealed redemption's plan, and God provides himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb, the only sacrifice that sin demands. Just as he proved to Abraham, he would provide himself a lamb. Behold the lamb, God himself the Lamb. I hope you will think about these thoughts in the weeks and days ahead. And that if this Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has meaning to you, that you will make sure that His great sacrifice for you is not in vain. He shed His blood for you and for me. But we must respond to that sacrifice by doing what He has asked us to do. We must believe that He is the Son of God. We must be convinced of that. John wrote his gospel to prove that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in His name, John 20, 30 and 31. Do you doubt that Jesus was real? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus asks us to repent of our sins and confess our faith in Him and even to be baptized. Again, is Christ magnified in your life? Remember, one day we will stand in His presence. And it's going to be very difficult for you to deny that Jesus ever lived when you come face to face with Him. Paul reminded us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father, Philippians 1. Not a question of if you're going to confess that, it's only a matter of when. You can do it now to your eternal salvation, or you can do it then to your eternal separation from God. Please give this some serious thought. Thank you for listening. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. 
we need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.